narrow streets of the city of Rome as they look from above today, you can see that again, the city grew in a fairly ad hoc way, as I mentioned. It wasn't planned all at once. It just grew up over time, beginning in the 8th century BC. Now this is interesting, because what we know about the Romans is when they were left to their own devices and they could build the city from scratch, they didn't let it grow in an ad hoc way. They, they structured it in a, in a very care, very methodical way that was basically based on military strategy, military planning. The Romans they couldn't have conquered the world without obviously having a masterful military enterprise. And they everywhere they went on the various campaigns, their various military campaigns. They would build, build camps and those camps were always laid out in a very geometric plan along a grid, usually square or rectangular. An essay is a chance to identify your read and learned. As a writer, you first need to collect many materials, then write an essay in four or five paragraphs, structures and quotes. If someone is searching for a book or article to read, he or she will decide from the very beginning whether this work is worth attention. If you want to wow your teacher, polish the introduction, especially the first couple of sentences. Add an essay hook something interesting, funny, shocking, or intriguing to win the reader's attention. Build an emotional connection with your reader right from the start. A hook in the essay is a catchy sentence or paragraph in the impressive introduction which serves as an attention element and an important part. An excellent hook sentence is engaging and interesting. It is a perfect method to start an argumentative or persuasive essay. The hook for your essay often appears in the first sentence. The opening paragraph includes a thesis sentence. Some popular hook choices can include using an interesting quote, a little-known fact, famous last words, or a statistic. In such an environment, warfare is no longer purely directed against the military potential of adversarial state. It is rather directed at infiltrating all areas of their societies and to threaten their existences. The comparatively easy access to weapons of mass destruction, in particular relatively and low-cost biological agents, is of key concern. Both government and non-governmental actors prefer to use force in a way that can be characterized as unconventional, or also as small wars. War waged according to conventions is an interstate phenomenon. The small war is the archetype of war in which the protagonists acknowledge no rules and permanently try to violate what conventions do exist. The protagonists of the small war observe neither international standards nor arms control agreements. They make use of territories where they do not have to fear any sanctions because there is no functioning state to assume charge of such sanctions or because the state in question is too weak to impose such sanctions. This type of war does not provide for any warning time. 
It challenges not only the external security of the nation states and international community, but also their internal safety. Disabled people were among the early adopters of personal computers. They were quick to appreciate that word processing programs and printers gave them freedom from dependence on others to read and write for them. Some of these disabled early adopters became very knowledgeable about what could be achieved and used their knowledge to become independent students at a high level. They also gained the confidence to ask that providers of education make adjustments so that disabled students could make better use of course software and the web, rather than just word processing. For some disability groups, information in electronic format, whether computer-based or web-based, can be more accessible than printed information. For example, people who have limited mobility or limited manual skills can find it difficult to obtain or hold printed material. Visually impaired people can find it difficult or impossible to read print, but both these groups can be enabled to use a computer and, therefore, access the information electronically. Online communication can enable disabled students to communicate with their peers on an equal basis. For example, a deaf student or a student with Asperger's syndrome may find it difficult to interact in a face-to-face -face tutorial, but may have less difficulty interacting when using a text conferencing system in which everyone types and reads text. In addition, people's disabilities are not necessarily visible in online communication systems, so disabled people do not have to declare the disability and are not perceived as being different. In its periodic quest for culinary identity, Australia automatically looks to its indigenous ingredients, the foods that are native to this country. There can be little doubt that using an indigenous product must qualify a dish as Australian notes Stephanie Alexander. Similarly, and without qualification, states that a uniquely Australian food culture can only be based upon foods indigenous to this country, Although, as Krull remarks, proposing Australian native foods as national symbols relies more upon their association with nature and geographic origin than on common usage. Notwithstanding the lack of justification for the premise that national dishes are, of necessity, founded on ingredients native to the country, after all, Italy's gastronomic identity is tied to the non-indigenous tomato, Thailand's to the non-indigenous chili, the reality is that Australians do not eat indigenous foods in significant quantities. The exceptions are fish, crustaceans and shellfish from oceans, rivers and lakes, most of which are unarguably unique to this country. Despite valiant and well-intentioned efforts today at promoting and encouraging the consumption of native resources, bush foods are not harvested or produced in sufficient quantities for them to be a standard component of Australian diets, nor are they generally accessible.
We can't see it, but brains hum with electrical activity. Brain waves created by the coordinated firing of huge collections of nerve cells pinball around the brain. The waves can ricochet from the front of the brain to the back, or from deep structures all the way to the scalp and then back again. Called neuronal oscillations, these signals are known to accompany certain mental states. Quiet alpha waves ripple soothingly across the brains of meditating monks. Beta waves rise and fall during intense conversational turns. Fast gamma waves accompany sharp insights. Sluggish delta rhythms lull deep sleepers, while dreamers shift into slightly quicker theta rhythms. Researchers have long argued over whether these waves have purposes, and what those purposes might be. Some scientists see waves as inevitable but useless by-products of the signals that really matter, messages sent by individual nerve cells. Waves are simply a consequence of collective neural behavior, and nothing more, that view holds. But a growing body of evidence suggests just the opposite, instead of by-products of important signals, brain waves are key to how the brain operates, rooting information among far-flung brain regions that need to work together. Mitz L. Miller is among the neuroscientists amassing evidence that waves are an essential part of how the brain operates. Banks provide short-term finance to companies in the form of an overdraft on a current account. The advantage of an overdraft is its flexibility. When the cash needs of the company increase with seasonal factors, the company can continue to write checks and watch the overdraft increase. When the goods and services are sold and cash begins to flow in, the company should be able to watch the overdraft decrease again. The most obvious example of a business which operates in this pattern is farming. The farmer uses the overdraft to finance the acquisition of seed for arable farming, or feed through the winter for stock farming and to cover the period when the crops or animals are growing and maturing. The overdraft is reduced when the crops or the animals are sold. The main disadvantage of an overdraft is that it is repayable on demand. The farmer whose crop fails because of bad weather knows the problem of being unable to repay the overdraft. Having overdraft financing increases the worries of those who manage the company. The other disadvantage is that the interest payable on overdrafts is variable. When interest rates increase, the cost of the overdraft increases. Furthermore, for small companies there are often complaints that the rate of interest charged is high compared with that available to larger companies. The banks answer that the rates charged reflect relative risk and it is their experience that small companies are more risky. Research shows that when people work with a positive mindset, performance on nearly every level productivity, creativity, engagement improves. Yet happiness is perhaps the most misunderstood driver of performance. For one, most people believe that success precedes happiness. Once I get a promotion, I'll be happy, they think. Or, 
Once I hit my sales target, I'll feel great. But because success is a moving target as soon as you hit your target, you raise it again, the happiness that results from success is fleeting. In fact, it works the other way around, people who cultivate a positive mindset perform better in the face of challenge. I call this the happiness advantage, every business outcome shows improvement when the brain is positive. I've observed this effect in my role as a researcher and lecturer in 48 countries on the connection between employee happiness and success. And I'm not alone, in a meta-analysis of 225 academic studies, researchers Sonia Lyubomirsky, Laura King, and Ed Diener found strong evidence of directional causality between life satisfaction and successful business outcomes. Another common misconception is that our genetics, our environment, or a combination of the two determines how happy we are. To be sure, both factors have an impact. What is known as prior knowledge or pre-existing knowledge is the knowledge, skill or ability that a learner brings to a new learning encounter. This includes all knowledge that is available before the learning event, and which has been gathered or developed by any means, and in any situation, including both formal and, quite often, informal learning situations. Learners need enough previous knowledge and understanding to enable them to learn new things. They also need help making links with new and previous explicit knowledge. It is considered to be valuable to go through a process of what has been called activating prior knowledge. Teachers often go through this process at the beginning of a new topic. They also use introductory strategies at the beginning of lessons which are continuations from previous lessons. In terms of the practicalities of teaching, this is a process of making children think about the topic or remember what has been covered already. In terms of theory, it is to do with activating particular schemas. Ecology is the study of interactions of organisms among themselves and with their environment. It seeks to understand patterns in nature, e.g., the spatial and temporal distribution of organisms and the processes governing those patterns. Climatology is the study of the physical state of the atmosphere, its instantaneous state or weather, its seasonal to interannual variability, its long-term average condition or climate, and how climate changes over time. These two fields of scientific study are distinctly different. Ecology is a discipline within the biological sciences and has as its core the principle of natural selection. Climatology is a discipline within the geophysical sciences based on applied physics and fluid dynamics. Both, however, share a common history. The origin of these sciences is attributed to Aristotle and theorists and their books Meteorological and Inquiry into Plants, respectively but their modern beginnings trace back to natural history and plant geography. 17th, 18th, 
and 19th century naturalists and geographers saw changes in vegetation as they explored new regions and laid the foundation for the development of ecology and climatology as they sought explanations for these geographic patterns.